Um, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, coming here to the Bennett Institute's annual public policy lecture. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Andy Haldane, Chief Economist of the Bank of England, member of the Monetary Policy Committee, and chair of the newly created Industrial Strategy Council to, um, to give the presentation for us. My name's Diane Coyle. I'm the Bennett Professor of Public Policy here in Cambridge. I've known Andy for quite a long time, not quite as long as he's been working at the bank, which is um, quite a few years now. Um, I'm looking forward immensely to continuing working with him on the industrial strategy um, work. He's um, well known as a, uh, an independent thinker, somebody who questions deeply economics, economic policy. He is just so such a good fit for our priorities here at the Bennett Institute, thinking about the implementation of policy, issues of inequality, productivity, people's living standards, and also crossing disciplinary boundaries and not being, able, and not being afraid to ask questions. So uh, I'm going to hand over now to Andy. The plan is that he will talk for 20 minutes or so, and then I will join him here and we'll have a bit of conversation before we throw the floor open to your questions. So please join me in welcoming Andy Haldane. Thank you, Diane, for that very kind uh, and charitable introduction, not mentioning how many years I worked at the Bank of England. It's a, it's a lot. Um, and thank you all for coming along this evening. It's great to see uh, you all uh, and great to be at the Bennett Institute, uh, which is doing fantastic work uh, in the area of all important public policy. Actually, let me start with uh, the most important point I'm going to make this evening, which is directed, I think, well, to everyone, but especially the students. Uh, in the audience, which is, um, I want to say to you, the same thing I say to all of the new graduate entrants to the Bank of England, uh, and that's the following. Um, there are very few things in this day and age that uh, an employer uh, can offer an employee. Certainly no certainty about that job being there forever. But there is one thing right now that I think I could say to, and do say, to our new graduate entrants, and I do say with a very high degree of confidence and certainty, uh, and that's that I think it's extremely likely that this point in history uh, will be one you'll be telling your friends and family, your children and grandchildren about. And more importantly than that, this is a unique, once-in-a-generation opportunity to shape the course of public policy. Because so many things currently are upside down, so many things need rethinking with as clean a sheet of paper as you are ever likely to get. So if you're not enjoying public policy now, <laughs> you are never going to enjoy it. Do something else with your life. Uh, but what it's worth, I think, the opportunity to write that next chapter of the history books for the young generation has never been greater than now. I want to touch upon some of that uh, this evening. What I want to talk about is how best, how best we can begin to think about uh, developing, augmenting, rethinking, reorienting, really, our frameworks for understanding the economy uh, and our frameworks for assessing the impact of policy on the economy. And I think the scope there for a pretty fundamental rethink is very considerable. I want to share with you some thoughts, some reflections, uh, some of them ambitious, about how those frameworks might be tweaked might be changed, might in some cases be fundamentally reoriented to make for better public policy, to reshape public policy at as important a time as we're likely to get uh, in this generation. So um, I wanted to start actually uh, with a demonstration of the simplest possible system uh, of motion, of movement, uh, and it's this one. Let me uh, call up. So this is a pendulum. Don't stare too hard. <laughs> um, 
unless you want to miss the rest of the lecture. Um, simple Newton Newtonian laws of motion, of reaction, having an equal and opposite reaction. Um, this is a system which is regular in its motion. Uh, if you allowed that energy to dissipate, the ball bearing would come to a state of rest. So a single equilibrium, single stationary equilibrium with pretty regular movement. This is not the worst description, not just of the physical world, but actually of how much of economics considers itself. A hundred years ago, the Swedish economist Knut Vixell used the metaphor of a rocking horse being hit by a stick to describe the law of motion of the economic system. And a hundred years on, many of our frameworks for thinking still have that roughly similar law of motion, a Newtonian law of motion, which is regular, singular, and stationary. It's remarkable, though, that you don't have to do very much to change this system to result in very different dynamics. Let me just tweak this system ever so slightly, ever so slightly. Instead of having this single representative agent in the language of economics, I'm going to move to having two of those agents, two ball bearings. And crucially, these ball bearings will now interact with one another. OK? Doesn't sound implausible as a description of the economic world, right? There's not one agent, there is more than one. And those two agents, being social entities, now interact. So we move from a single pendulum, a single rocking horse, to two horses that are interacting. How does that alter the laws of motion of that simple system? Well, here's how. This is now a double pendulum. Starts like a normal one, and then starts behaving in a rather more interesting fashion, actually. Uh, simplest possible change to the simple system, right? Not one moving part, but two interacting. And you get not a regular pattern, a rather irregular and actually beautiful pattern. Um, it's no longer singular and stationary. It's non-stationary. It's quasi-chaotic, actually, in its movements. And this, is come, this comes from the simplest possible augmentation of this system. So hold that in your head as we go through. Because in some ways, I think the trick is to develop economic frameworks for thinking that allow for the possibility of these irregular movements, the sort of things, sorts of things, that occur regularly in economic and financial systems and the sort of situations where public policy comes into its own. You can't come to Cambridge and not have a quote from Keynes. So here's mine, <laughs> augmented with that other staple, a quote from Einstein. Uh, both of them, I won't read them out, both of them will be very familiar to everyone in this room. Uh, the key point to note is that neither is actually a quote by either man, um, <laughs> as far as best we can tell. But nonetheless, uh, make an important point about making sense of the world and how you need to change your mind when the world stops behaving in the way you'd expect it. And when it comes to the macro economy, when it comes to economic and financial systems, we don't need to cast our minds back too far to think of a situation where that system behaved not as we had expected. <coughs> The facts changed, and they changed pretty radically. Let me demonstrate that. This is a picture of UK growth on the left, world growth on the right. Um, right up until the dawn of the crisis in 2007. After that point, I've stuck on some forecasts that were made about how the economy would perform in the years that followed. 2008 onwards. You'll see on the left-hand side panel, 
Those four castes were very tightly grouped together. Very few people anticipated even a slowing uh, of growth, and some anticipated uh, a pickup in growth. The same was largely true uh, of the world economy and projections for that. We all know uh, what happened next. This is what happened next. Uh, not just uh, a fall in growth, but in fact uh, a recession indeed, not just a recession, but the biggest one we've seen uh, since the 1930s. It was a big one to have missed. It was missed not just in the UK, but globally. And what's more, look at the right-hand side picture. We continued to overestimate how quickly growth would return. We missed not just the fall from grace, but the pace of the subsequent uh, recovery. We were surprised. In a way, perhaps, if we look through the lens of history, we ought not to have been. This looks just at the distribution of left-hand side GDP, right-hand side a measure of asset prices, of equity prices, looked at over the very long run, in this case, hundreds of years. The blue, uh, the blue line here is, as we would expect GDP growth and asset prices to behave if they were normal, if they were Gaussian. And the key takeaway is a whole chunk of this distribution lies outside of the tails of the normal distribution. Fat tails, much fatter than we normally expect, are in fact not the exception, but the rule. We were surprised, but perhaps we should not have been. Now, the significance of these fat tails for macroeconomists, for public policymakers, could not be greater. The very discipline of macroeconomics was crafted here in Cambridge in response to the previous fat-tailed Great Depression. These are the points in history when macro really matters. And these are the points in history where public policy comes into its own. If we cannot make sense of the world, and if we cannot reshape the world in response to those fat tails, we are not doing our job as macroeconomists, and we are not doing our job as policymakers. That would be my contention. We need, therefore, some frameworks, some models, some ways of thinking that can capture and make sense of those fat-tailed events. And frameworks that don't need to be not relied on. The rest, what happens inside the blue lines, that's for fun, OK? That can make my fun models. But models that matter, they're in the fat tails. And if your model can't generate the fat tails, it isn't of most use when push comes to shove. So the facts have changed. Hello, they've been there for quite some while. Have we changed our minds? Have economists changed their minds? Well, there has been quite a lot over the course of the last 10 years of revisionist thinking in a very helpful direction. There really has been progress in how we think about systems, economic and financial moving. Nonetheless, we are a bit up against it because as a profession, economists tend to be a bit on the insular side. This chart demonstrates that it plots the extent to which economists cross site other disciplines and vice versa. As you head towards the northeast, you are doing well. Towards the southeast, you're doing less well. And economics does not fare especially well. Um, that might help explain, perhaps might help explain, why accompanying the global financial crisis, there has been uh, a something of a lessening, a loss of trust within the profession of economics. Um, this chart demonstrates that. It's a, uh, based on a survey, you know, thank heavens for the politicians, just keeping us off the <laughs> bottom of the table. 
Um, but this is, a, this is a weak starting point, a weak starting point, and perhaps an unsurprising starting point, given what we have seen. So I want to talk a bit about how, then, we begin to change our minds in making sense, in making better sense, of the dynamics of economic and financial systems in future. And here are some of the tools of the trade. One's familiar, I imagine, to everyone in this room. The sorts of things we draw upon to make sense, not just of economics and finance, but of other things too. Stories, narratives of how the world works. Facts, numbers to describe how the world works. Models, simplified characterizations of how the world works. And perhaps even experiments to explore the impact of certain interventions, including policy interventions. Those are among the tools of the trade that most disciplines would bring to bear when making sense of their own systems. And the same is true, by and large, when making sense of economic and financial systems. Indeed, I'd say in economics, we have been on something of an evolutionary arc over the course of the last several hundred years. We started with stories of how the world works. We moved on to the use of facts to back up or verify those stories. From there, we crafted models that simplified those stories and facts. Thus far, though, relatively modest steps have been made towards using experiments in the same way as they're extensively used in some of the natural and other social sciences. And that's a theme towards which I want to return uh, towards uh, the end. Indeed, not just has this evolutionary arc been on, but now I'd say um, for many economists, there's a hierarchy in the use of those tools. Many would say the starting point would be to develop a simplified but rigorous model of the world, to take that then to data and then to fit a story to it. A sort of Popperian deductive or positivist approach to problem solving and making sense uh, of the world. Let me give a few examples of the way in which this evolutionary arc has moved through uh, over the centuries, starting with stories. So plenty of stories were used by the classical economists to make sense of the world. I'm sure some of these would be familiar to some of you. Adam Smith's uh, famous pin factory to make the point about specialization. David Ricardo, even more poignant, David Ricardo's uh, cloth and wine metaphor. This is, this is Portugal sending, s selling wine to, the, to, to England, <coughs> England selling cloth to Portugal. No mention of Brexit in Ricardo's book, and for that we should be eternally thankful. But a very important um, point uh, that remains as relevant today as when it was crafted 200 years ago. Uh, Thomas Malthus, we all know about. Keynes and animal spirits, uh, very much a story. Uh, in fact, um, proper storytellers uh, like Daniel Defoe and Jane Austen also knew, used the notion of animal spirits uh, in their works of fiction to describe the world. And last but not least, the example I mentioned with, which was Knut uh, Vixel's uh, rocking horse. Facts, here's lots of facts. Economists like facts, and often those facts, those descriptions of the past, have been a prime mover of thinking. I give a few examples here, at least two of which were handmade uh, in Cambridge. Models, uh, plenty of models. I've listed some here, I won't go through that list. Uh, also on an evolutionary arc. Uh, today, most economists would say that the state of the art, the very frontier of best thinking, would be these things called DSGE models, Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Models. As a friend said to me just a few weeks ago, Andy, what is there not to like about that? They are dynamic. They are stochastic, and they are general equilibrium. This must be as good uh, as it gets when it comes to modeling. 
In some respect, that's possibly true. In other respects, I'll come on to, it might not be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, experiments, as I mentioned, when it comes to understanding the wider economy, when it comes to macro, have been the path less followed. When making sense of the impact of policy, we've tended not to use lab experimental environments. Instead, we've taken our models, we've applied to them some policy rule and figured out the impact. And that's what we've tended to do when crafting, designing uh, policies. I want to come back to whether we might do something different in future to give a more realistic read of how the world might respond following policy interventions. So those are some of the moving parts uh, that have been used. There are problems, of course, with each and every one of them. I listed some of the problems with each and every one uh, here. But the broader point I want to make uh, is not that each and every element has some problems, but that we might be better thinking about them not as a hierarchy, but as an interlocking set of building blocks when making sense of how the economy and financial system works. I think there is real value, and the point, the point I want to make and argue is there's real value in harnessing the power of all four of those elements in some combined pluralist fashion. Like combining the insights of both that Karl Popper deductive approach of the 1950s and Francis Bacon's inductive approach from the 17th uh, century, borrowing models and technologies from outside of current economics and finance, leading us to that insularity, if you like, and in which we don't see models as being at the top of the methodological hierarchy, but as instead one piece alongside stories, facts, and perhaps even the greater use of experiments. So let me explore that a bit, starting with stories. Well, we know a lot about stories, don't we? Um, it seems that stories have been with us for as long as humans have existed as a way of making sense of the world and passing down, importantly, that knowledge across generations. Often using, we now know from psychology, rather simplified shortcuts, rules of thumb of various types when making complex decisions. Some would say, some have said, those shortcuts are therefore somehow irrational or non-optimal. Well, uh, that's true in some states of the world, but not true in others. In a world where there is genuine uncertainty in the night sense of the world, not knowing about the world, it's by no means clear that using simple heuristics or rules of thumb is indeed irrational. In fact, in those settings where you really don't know, simple rules of thumb might be the best you can do given the environment. They are is what's called sometimes ecologically rational. They are rational given the information ecology in which you operate. An example of that, you know, so uh, modern portfolio theory was developed uh, by Bob Merton and Harry Markowitz. It emphasized the importance of weighing risk and return when making investment choices. And yet, when it came to Harry Markowitz retiring, did he abide by his own rule when investing his, when, when investing his retirement pot? Well, no, he didn't actually. He followed a much simpler rule, which is to, to divide the assets equally across that portfolio, a one over n rule, which, guess what, in experimental settings, has been found to perform as well or better 
as his risk, optimizing risk return um, theory. And these days, these stories, I think, an increasingly, increasingly important driver of economic and financial behaviour. All sorts of studies now coming out emphasise the importance of, call them animal spirits, uh, call it emotion, in driving behaviours in financial markets, when investing in assets, among companies, when deciding whether to invest, when making sense of those big swings recessions and booms and depressions. It looks like the prevailing popular narrative is a key driver and amplifier of those big swings, those fat tails that I emphasized earlier on. The rational things, the financial things like income, they matter, and wealth, it matters. We're making true sense of the really big swings you need some emotion and story on top, a prevailing popular narrative of pessimism or of optimism. And what's more, we can go further these days, of course. We can apply this age-old principle of stories using the most modern of semantic data science algorithmic techniques. We can use words as data as a window on people's souls, as a way of capturing their sentiment, their emotion, individually and collectively. This is a question of using words as data to tell a story about prevailing mood. Here's an example. These are, I tried to mention Brexit, but I can't help myself. Um, these are, um, this takes reports from the bank's agents around the country. They have conversations, conversations with companies that tell stories about the economy. We write down those conversations, and this applies some semantic, semantic algorithmic techniques to extract the words that people are using to describe the economic environment right now. Right-hand side picture is the use of the word Brexit or referendum in those conversations as a way of gauging how sentiment is emerging over time. Not just the words used by companies, you can apply it too to the words used by people like me, by policymakers. You can take the minutes of our meeting and apply the same techniques to try and figure out what are the sentiments being expressed by the monetary policy committee. Here's an example uh, of just that taken from our minutes. These sentiments, the, the capturing of popular narratives, which as I say in a world of social media have never been more important, never more contagious, never more virulent than now. The difference now is we can capture these things scientifically using data science techniques. And we should if we are to replicate those booms and busts we've seen historically. Just one more point on this. We can also use techniques typically seen as being outside of economists' toolbox. For example, the techniques of anthropology uh, and sociology, by which I mean sitting down and having those conversations with people about how they are perceiving the economy. And that's something the bank has taken to heart over the last few years. I've been touring the country, having just those conversations. And capturing them actually, not using words, but using pictures. I take a visual scribe with me who draws pictures of the conversations that I have with the public, capturing their view on the key drivers of their decisions at the time. Because there's no other way of capturing those conversations. There's no other way of capturing those emotions other than to have the conversation face to face. These are some of the things we're exploring as a way of getting under the skin of what's really driving people's 
behaviours, the stories they tell themselves. Let me move to facts. So here's a word that divides a room, and the word is data mining. So hands up who's an economist in the room. Come on, who you are. <laughs> One or two. Um, no crime in economics is more heinous than to mine the data. It's the last resort of the scoundrel, right? Mining the data. You mention the words data mining to a data scientist, they think bingo. <laughs> this is a genuine gold mine. Uh, there's something important there, I think, uh, which is being made more important by the fact that, of course, we now have this tsunami of big data, so-called, washing over us when it comes to understanding the economy, when it comes to understanding the financial system. I've given some facts on that here. And even better, we are now developing bits of kit that enable us to make sense, digest and sift that big data to help us tell stories, that word again, about how the economic and financial system is working. I've given some examples here of how those big data are transforming how we think about uh, inflation, how we think about uh, GDP. At the bank, we're making extensive use of big data, granular data, in the setting of public policy. Let me give you an example. So a few years ago, we decided to look at whether we should constrain the amount of mortgages at high loan-to-income multiples that banks might extend. But what impact would that have on different households? What impact would that have across different parts of the country? We needed to know, and luckily enough, we had a database in-house that captured every mortgage to every household made over the preceding several decades. So we could produce this picture, which looks at the fraction of mortgages in different parts of the country above that loan to income multiple, and then figure out how many, and indeed which households, would be captured if we impose some restriction on banks' capacity to lend above certain multiples. And that was a policy we ended up enacting uh, in practice. Those same granular data can be used to provide a more in-depth answer to the question, how has QE affected you? So QE is a policy done by the bank and many other central banks. It's not always been universally acclaimed. Some people have, have said, hang on, uh, isn't this just ramping up asset prices and therefore making the rich richer? widening inequalities in society? That's a perfectly legitimate question. How do you go about answering that question? Well, the most obvious way is to try and figure out how those policy actions, QE or lower interest rates, are affecting each and every household across the UK. And that we did to address head-on the critique and say, is it really the case that some people are being made much worse off by this policy? And if you do that calculus on a very granular basis and, and ask how is monetary policy, how is low rates and QE affecting different cohorts' income or different cohorts' wealth? This is split by age. I could cut this any which way you like. I could cut it by income. I could cut it by region and figure out who are the winners and how large are the number of losers. Addressing head-on that critique, and in this case, we concluded the numbers made worse off in financial terms by QE was very small, like less than 10% of the population. If I, go, I can go one step further, actually, and say, this is how it's affected your income, this is how you expect your wealth. And this is how it's affected your happiness. I can link this to happiness too. So I can answer the question, has QE made you happy? 
And the good news is, it has. Um, we don't expect thanks for that sort of thing. <laughs> but um, the importance of this is it's no longer good enough as a public policymaker to say, I have made the average person better off. Because the average person doesn't exist. We need to tell a story that speaks to how our policies affect each and everyone. Accepting sometimes that not everyone can be made better off. And explaining that clearly and candidly to the public, I think, is an important new frontier of public policy, certainly for the Bank of England. Models. I won't dwell on this, but when that friend of mine said to me a few weeks ago, what is there not to like? Dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium. Uh, as put, that was reasonable, except, of course, there are lots of types of models that are dynamic, stochastic, and general equilibrium. Some of them are listed here. I won't dwell on them. Um, this sort of has a scheme of thinking about different models of that general type. The key point here is that there are a plurality of those models, and there's virtue in that plurality, in developing a whole set of frameworks for making sense of how the world works. Particularly those, I think, that make sense of those all-important interactions between agents. Remember that picture? That's just one interaction between two moving parts. The world, as we know, the economy, has many interactive moving parts that shape, very importantly, its dynamics. There is a class of models, so-called agent-based models, that take very seriously just those interactions between agents of various types. This framework has been extensively applied to all manner of problems in both the natural and the social sciences. I've given some examples here uh, at the bottom. Uh, this same framework, unsurprisingly, can also be applied and has been applied to make sense of the financial system. Indeed, here's an example of just that. This is a map of the financial web for a particular product. You'll see the complexity of the interactions and moving parts uh, within it. It is those very interactions and moving parts that generate those fat tails I showed you at the top of the show. And what's true of the financial system is also true of parts of the economy. For example, the housing market, which in fact is not one market, but many. It's a market for mortgages. It's a market for those renting. It's a, mar it's a market for those uh, buying or buying to letting. Without some sense of the interaction between those different moving parts, it's very difficult to begin to understand the dynamics of house prices as shown on the right-hand side uh, picture. So different models taking seriously interactions between atomistic agents and generating just those booms and busts, just those fat tails we see being exhibited in both the real economy and in financial markets. This is my last set of issues. And this is very much the path uh, less followed when it comes to understanding and making sense of the macroeconomy, um, which is the use of experiments, using use lab techniques to understand the impact of policy. It's been used in some development economic settings and in some micro environments, but by and large has not been used when it comes to understanding the economy at large or the financial system uh, at large. Um, is that justified? Or could we make greater use of experiments to figure out what impact our macro policies 
might have. Be quite nice if we could, wouldn't it? That way, instead of just doing something, we could test it beforehand. We could try before we buy when it comes to public policy. If you're producing a drug, it would be unheard of, irresponsible, not to go through extensive clinical trials with the public. And yet, if you're crafting or inventing a new policy, a macro policy, you don't go through those same hoops. Could we, should we, develop a framework in which that becomes not the exception, but the rule? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I want to mention that we've begun experimenting with the use of experiments in the design of policy at the Bank of England. I've given two examples here. One was figuring out what impact uh, a system for regulating bankers' bonuses had on their risk-taking. Uh, and the second example uh, was trying to figure out how we could best communicate with the wider public on monetary policy matters. In both cases, we set up a RCT, a randomized control environment, trying to figure out how these two policies would affect behavior. Um, that's the good news, not the bad news. We only did that after we'd put the policies in place, right? <laughs> so it's kind of half good. But better late than never, I'd say. Uh, and certainly a demonstration that this can be done in at least some environments. Let me give you, um, this example was uh, exactly a year ago. We said, look, we've been producing this report on the left-hand side for 20 years. It's 60 pages. It's densely written. It's got so many charts you would not believe. Uh, it is not widely read. It's inaccessible to almost everyone. Could we produce a version of it that is accessible to a much wider range of the public. Um, well, we tried, and the try was on the uh, right-hand side here. Let's produce a one-line, one-picture version of those 60 pages, and let's produce a one-page, several-chart version uh, of that 60-page report. Having done that, did that help in making sense of the Bank of England's messages? Did it improve understanding, and did it improve trust? Well, that sort of thing is amenable uh, to a randomized control trial, so we did. And the answer, thank heavens, after the fact, uh, was yes. Uh, the, I'm not sure what color that is. What color does that look like? That's sort of brown. That's before, and the gray uh, is after. Uh, and that might not look dramatic, but I'm told by the experts on this that has a very significant treatment effect. 25% increase uplift in understanding, a bit less in trust. <laughs> from having followed through on that, from having simplified, from having shortened. And the last bar is when we made it relatable to people's lives. We used our report as a vehicle for storytelling. And surprise, surprise, when you do that, the boost to understanding uh, is greatest. Could we go further? These are still quite mini examples. Could we go maxi? Could we go macro? I'm not sure, but I've been exploring this for the last year or two, the possibility of using mass person gaming technology to begin to understand those all-important interactions between different people. There are already... Any, any gamers in the room? Just you, sir. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank heavens you're here. Um, Eve on World of Warcraft? No, Both. Just Eve. Um, we have these multi-person interactive games out there already. Uh, some of them have prim primitive economies in them as well, actually. Could those be used? Could those be used in anger to assess the impact of policy or indeed communications about policy before the fact rather than after the fact? I'm not sure, but I think it's a interesting thought experiment. The trick, apparently, because I've started speaking to gamers uh, to understand what they do for a living, the trick is, can you craft a game 
uh, that is escapist enough to be worth playing, but realistic enough to give you decent answers. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that circle can be square, but I'm going to keep on trying because the answer is perhaps. And if so, that provides a vehicle for us trying before we buy when it comes to designing and crafting and executing public policy. Why well, would we not want to try and do that? Um, let me wind up. This one is a quote by Einstein. Uh, the previous one wasn't. Uh, and the point is this. Uh, development of Western science based on two great achievements. First, the formal logic system, Greek philosophers. When it comes to economics and finance, we are using that. That's what that DSG model is, by the way. But the second, discovery of causal relationships by systematic experiments. On that front right now, public policy has a mixed record. On macro policy, uh, a particularly mixed record. Could? Should we do better when designing systems and policies that prevent us having those fat tails in future? I think possibly yes. So here's my last slide. There's a rainbow on there for, for reasons I really don't understand. Um, um, but it's making the point that when looking to the future, we'd be better served, I think, by not having a strict hierarchy among these approaches, but instead to see them as interlocking pieces of the jigsaw with perhaps experiments as one of those jigsaw pieces. Dan, I've overshot, so I should stop on that. Thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm.